Okay. Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Chelsea Ogner. <laughs> and um, I'm going to have her explain exactly who she is and what she does and, and dive right in. Hi, Chelsea. All right, great. Hi, Peggy. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am Chelsea Odner, and I'm the Vice President of Publishing for the Swedenborg Foundation. And so I help run the Off the Left Eye YouTube channel that uh, Curtis Childs is the host of that you maybe have seen on this um, channel. He was interviewed by Peggy. Um, and I am especially interested in the way our dreams are a conduit for spiritual guidance, for connecting with uh, people on the other side, you know, loved ones who we've lost. Um, and, uh, but then also the kind of insight that we can get from dreams that help us live our lives in this world and continue our, our spiritual journeys. So, yeah. Okay. And yeah, so I, um, I was excited to get to talk to you, Peggy, because I sort of have both of those experiences. Um, I, I love hearing from people about connecting with loved ones who've died um, through their dreams. And I specifically had that uh, myself. My mom died when I was 10 years old. Um, and yeah, and, uh, and I was raised um, in this small, like it's a small religious denomination, but so I work for the Swedenborg foundation now, but, um, that a Christian denomination that bases its teachings on what Emanuel Swedenborg wrote and those, um, all the various books he wrote. And now the, the Swedenborg foundation is a non-affiliated with any religious denomination. We just publish and promote Swedenborg's teachings and get people to, you know, explore the books and stuff like that. Um, but part of the framework that that meant I was raised with was this way that uh, our, that the spiritual world is real, that when loved ones die, they immediately continue their lives in the spiritual world. And, and so when my mom died, I had this sense of, I, I know she's there. And I know that I have a, like that my spirit is already living amongst, you know, is connected to the spiritual world right now. Um, and uh, and so I don't know if that was enough that I was sort of open to this possibility, but it was a few, maybe over the first couple of years after she died that I, um, experienced this kind of lucid dreaming where I would be in a dream and in a dream state, and then, um, would shift into another level of lucidity where I would then feel that. I wasn't just sort of observing myself in a dream. I was there in the dream conscious. And, uh, and in the, there was a series of these dreams. And in the first, it was that I found a, in my dream, suddenly there was like a doorway that went, that led to stone stairs that went down into this sort of, uh, dungeon, but that's kind of too dark of a word. Um, it's like, I like lower, the word dungeon <laughs> yeah, sure. um, in my, uh, which was in my house at the time. And, um, and I just had this sense that like, if I, it was, it was one of these funny experiences where in my dream, I had gotten, I had like gone to Burger King with friends or something weird. I mean, like I was 11 or something, you know, like what does an 11 year old dream about? And, um, and so I had this burger and I had this like intuition that if I left the burger in this one place in this stone dungeon, then if I came back and checked on it, I'd know whether my mom was around like that she would sort of signal to me that she was there and we could connect. And so in my dream, I remember leaving this as sort of like evidence of like a sign of like, here I am, you know, I'm open to, to conversation or something. And uh, sure enough, I had the same dream where I sort of shifted from whatever dream I was in to going down these stone steps to find evidence of like, did she get the burger? You know, like, did she get what I left for her? Um, and I remember finding only crumbs. And so I had this sense of like, she's somewhere and I can find her. So I remember going up into my house and uh, over these sequence of dreams, this would happen each time. And I would find her in a different part of my um, house. But my experience of her was not 
it was, it was her, you know, like there's just a different feeling when you have a dream of somebody where it's like, oh, that's just a weird figment of my imagination versus like, this is another being that I'm interacting with in this dream. And, um, and so I remember each time I interacted with her, she seemed to be progressing spiritually in her own spirit. So I, uh, the first time she looked just like she did well before she got sick with a brain tumor, but like herself. And I remember getting to, um, well, see her and she was actually, um, part of that experience was I, I slept in a room right across the wall from where I knew my dad was having visitors over at the time. And so in spirit, I really walked out of my room and saw my mom sitting over the back of the chair, kind of like listening in on the conversation. And, um, and then another time, um, I got to hug her, like I said, and then in another dream, I got to, um, she, uh, was, uh, she spoke to me. And when she spoke out loud, it was like bells chiming, these sort of like magical bell chiming sounds coming out of her mouth, but I could hear what she, I understood what she was saying and the love that she was expressing. Um, and so those, it was just like, I, I couldn't intend, I didn't know when I was going to have one of these dreams, but they recurred a number of times. Um, and the, the sort of culmination that I really almost, um, put on the level of, of near-death experiences. Cause I know you've, you've, you cover that content on your channel. And, um, and I've worked with, uh, or I have a friend who is a, who does some near death experience research. And so she interviewed me once about my experience. Cause even though it happened in a dream, it has so many of the hallmarks yeah. of a near death experience. Um, where I was, uh, I, and it was actually just not even at nighttime. It was just a nap that I took. Um, but I remember I fell asleep and when I woke up, I was, immediately, um, lucid and in sort of like a spiritual state. And I remember walking down this forest path where these large, deep trees that now I sort of recognize, they look like a deep German forest, like these deep, um, dark bark closely grown together and the roots kind of interlacing with each other and having this deep green moss growing over top of it. I was walking down this path. And I knew that I needed to, I came to a fork in the path and I had to decide which way was I going to go. Um, and I remember feeling suddenly this presence of my mom with me that I couldn't um, see her, but she was there behind me telling me which way, which way to go. And, um, oh man, I have to pause because I'm just remembering. I mean, this was back when I was like 11 or 12, but when when I said I woke up in that forest, I woke up to her. She was right there with me, like waking me up as if I was like coming to consciousness in the spiritual world. And, and I was so happy to see her. And I think we started to embrace. And then she sort of was like lifting off the ground as if she was going away from me. And I was afraid of that, but she said, just follow the path and I'll show you which way to go. And so then she sort of like disappeared. And so when I came to that fork in the path, she was, she came back just her sense of her presence telling me which way to go. And then that, that happened a couple more times where there was like this fork in the path I was following. And sure enough, she'd tell me, you know, go to the right, you know, follow the right path. And when I, like the third time I did that, I was walking towards walking down this path, but the path was getting eaten by this light you know, just the brightest, uh, love filled light that like the ground was just like merging into it. And so I was walking on the path. I was like, if I keep going, I'm going to walk into this light and I don't know what's on the other side. Cause I don't know if I can even see in it, but I kept moving forward. And so when I became enveloped with that light, um, I couldn't see for some time, um, like my eyes had to sort of adjust, you know, to the light. <laughs> And, um, and that was when like, she came back to me. So it was like, I don't know if I was like in another 
level, like I had entered a new spiritual state, so to speak. Um, but I was in that, uh, in that light and she returned and there were other, like these beings of light started forming out of the light and coming towards me and kind of gathering around me. And then we all just started to dance. Um, and that was like, you know, everybody dancing together. Um, and, uh, and there was even this like throne of light to my side that I couldn't totally see, but was there. And there was this like divine being who I knew, you know, I recognized as God, even though I don't think that God looks a particular way. You know, I think God appears to us, uh, in, in ways that make sense to us, you know? And, um, so this, there was this divine being sitting in this throne who was like barefoot, kicking up their feet, laughing, uh, <laughs> having such a delightful time and like lifted these rose petals up out of their lap and threw them up in the air. And the rose petals came like <laughs> dancing down around us. Yes. It was like a a really, really beautiful image that has stayed with me, you know, for all of that. And, and then, uh, it sort of had this feeling of like the, the, our time was coming to an end and it started to rain, but these raindrops were, they didn't collect on the ground, like puddles when it rained on you, it just got absorbed into your skin. Um, and it was like sort of settling the the atmosphere in a way. And, and so I recognized, okay, everybody was done dancing, these like beings that had come kind of walked out and merged back into the light. And I didn't want to say goodbye to my mom, but it was this like clear sense that she had sort of progressed in her own spirit at that point that it, she, she communicated to me, like, you're not going to be able to see me for a long time. Um, and even telling me things are going to get hard, like it's going to get dark and you're not going to see me for a long time, but remember, you know, I'm always with you and, um, you know, that you're going to be okay. And so, uh, we embraced and at that point, that divine being in that throne reached down their hands and picked me up and put me in their lap. And then covered me with a blanket of light and I fell back to sleep in my dream and then woke up in the, you know, in real waking life, uh, from this nap I had been taking. (laughs) Um, and so that I didn't have another lucid dream of my mom after that. Um, and really didn't feel like I had a strong sense of her presence with me until I was in my even in my thirties, I think really. Um, and, uh, but as I reflect back on it and after having studied, you know, so Emanuel Swedenborg was this 18th century scientist who wanted to study the seat of the soul, you know, like where, where is the soul? How does the soul actually exist in, in the world and our bodies? And, um, that sort of somehow his, his journey led him to having this amazing spiritual awakening where he had, you know, wakeful consciousness of the spiritual world while also being conscious of this world. And then he studied the spiritual world and how it interacted with his mind for nearly 30 years and published a number of books, which is what we publish at the Swedenborg Foundation. And so when I then as an adult was studying that material for myself, um, I just continue to be amazed with the parallels of like what, what I experienced. And then what I read Swedenborg having documented of the spiritual world and like the one-to-one that's there. And then again, in terms of near-death experiences broadly, uh, you know, the similarities that are there. Um, and so when I reflect back on it, I sort of feel like, as I understand it, when we, when we die, our spirits wake up in the spiritual world. And Swedenborg says that it's like walking from one room into another, you know, that's as simple as it is. When we discard the physical body, we are, are, we awaken spirit and, um, and we have a spiritual body, but then our state progresses where we kind of go through a transition period of letting go of like the earthly things about us and get more and more comfortable 
in the way the spiritual world works and things like that. So that eventually you can be, you know, you're, you then are going on to finding your spiritual community, you know, in the spiritual world or in heaven and, and realms like that. And so I sort of wonder if those dreams that I had, the way that my mom's spirit seemed to progress in those dreams was like seeing her as she looked to me in the natural world to then seeing a sort of more and more angelic form of her until until I almost wonder if she couldn't come back to meet me necessarily in the same way in this world, I had to go to her world. You know, I had to enter the spiritual world and see her. But then even then I couldn't stay there. You know, I couldn't, it was like, okay, no, this was, you got what you, the message you needed to have, but now you need to go back, you know, live, live your life in the material world. And, and that unfortunately, you know, it just means not having as much open communication with, you know, spirits, uh, in the spiritual world, but they're still there. And so anyway, my journey has definitely been like, uh, connecting with, uh, ha- having that dream experience and then connecting with my mom as, uh, how we all connect with angels in our lives, uh, now. And, um, yeah. So I guess before I go on into any other sort of spiritual life, like how dreams help us in our spiritual lives, that's sort of my that experience of connecting with a loved one through yeah. dreams. What I was thinking as you was talking is, and I could be wrong, but I think I remember reading once that um, age 10 is a really hard age for a child to lose a parent, whether yeah. divorce, death, of course. And my parents divorced when I was 10. Okay. And it seems yeah. so much harder on me than the other kids. And yeah. I thought of that when you said you were 10, oh, that tender age of 10. It is. I think there's, I mean, I had such an incredibly intense experience when my oldest daughter turned 10 because I was witnessing, and this only happened a couple of years ago and witnessing her, first of all, not having me be leaving her, like getting to witness somebody, my own daughter be 10 and have a mom, you know, have that stability. I mean, I feel so fortunate that I've been able to offer that to her and by, you know, grace haven't had to leave this world or anything. Um, but like, I, I totally noticed that of like, there's so much identity shaping that is happening when you're 10, you're really about to enter the sort of preteen, like, I know myself, I'm this, you know, independent person. And so you sort of need that, uh, that comfort and grounding. And so, oh my goodness. Yeah. The sort of, it, it, it definitely is intense. I feel like I'm still uncovering the ways that that has impacted me from losing And my G always will. I mean, it's, it's always yeah. in your heart. Oh, totally. love don't die. Oh yes, exactly. So. Yep. And, and you're so blessed to be given that those dreams. It's like, yeah. And I, I was thinking too, as you're talking is like, I know what it's like almost to be your mom, because during my mm. second NDE, Jesus and I went down to check on my kids to see how they would be if I didn't come oh. back like in the future. And my yes. kids were about um, four, five, six. And so they were look the same age. It was like, you know, and my young, my middle, my youngest biological, but my middle son, Jeremy, said to his older brother, says, I don't care that you say mom is dead. I want her back and I want her back right now. And I felt his pain. And I'm mm. thinking, I know what it's like to be a spirit mother, a ghost mother, and be there watching your children. Yes. And you're sitting here talking about your mom. and Yes. Oh, my goodness. That's really amazing to get to hear that reflection from you. And that's even something I've wondered about. Cause I do, you know, of, I have two sisters and neither of them had the same kind of dream experiences that I did of my mom. And yet actually something very precious is my younger sister has her own, has three daughters herself now and her daughters or her oldest daughter has connected to our mom in her dreams. She's had dreams of her and even had a dream of her before she knew how to recognize her in a photograph. So when she saw her in the photograph, she said, that's the woman that's been in my dreams. And just this, like, it gives me chills, but just this full circle of my younger sister who was, you know, 
that much younger than me, eight, when she lost her mom, sort of having, having that spiritual comfort coming through now through her own daughters, being able to have that experience. I don't know. It's just interesting. The sort of providence in it is, yeah. is a mystery, yeah. but it, it's really, really amazing. And apparently, you know, we must be allowed to go. I don't know if we have to always ask, you know, cause I was just like the entrance, but I didn't want to go, you know, and they, I was told it was my time, which, you know, most people are told. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. And, and I said, I was told the answer is no, that it was my time. Oh. And, and so I started pleading my case, you know, like in front of a yes. courtroom. And so I said, um, well, I know you're omniscient, so you can see in the future. If you can tell, yeah. you know, if my kids are going to be, you know, better off without me for whatever reason, I agree to stay. But if not, I beg to return. But all of a sudden I mm. see Jesus and then we went down. And yes. so it makes me wonder, not just now, but, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about things and thinking about you, your mom is, you know, is it always that way? You know? Yeah. Do we say, hey, I want to go down? Or are we just allowed to just go down when we want? But I, I can tell you mm. that happens because we were just like, we were in heaven and all of a sudden we were down, just like, like, shoo, yep. there. Yep. And we were hovered over the ceiling of the trailer. It was at night, but it, it was like there was no roof, like it just vanished. We could see right in. Sure. And then we dropped yep. down closer, right? Or we were at the ceiling of the bedroom. And so it's, it, it happens. I mean, I can tell you, they get to come see, because I did. Yeah. And when you, uh, so when you did go down with Jesus and you observed your kids, was that like you, you both got the sense of like, okay, no, you do need to go back. You're no, not going to cross what happened over now. Was, or I felt go. my son's pain when he yeah. said, he's crying. You know, I don't care yeah. if you stay mom is dead or we're back or we're back now. I felt his pain so bad in my heart. I retracted and then I'm back in the white light oh and, uh, that's so beautiful yeah yeah i was sobbing i was sobbing because i'm oh my god there's never been a pain in my life a heartache worse yeah. than that to yeah. feel my son missing his mom and feeling it's my fault i died because i had had the surgery and it wasn't you know when i had two pregnancy and stuff and, yes. and so but then it was washed away from me. It's like you, like if you get like really upset even at my five-year-old drowning if i got upset about something it would like be washed like a wave, like just, mm -hmm. and then, it, you know, like how like us say you have to deal with, uh, say your house just burned down and it's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And then it'll take you months to finally, okay, I'm home again. I'm everything. But sure. in heaven, it's like that. Oh sure. yes. You're yes. back from A to Z it's over. And you've learned the lesson you've, you know, been through it. And I also yes. want to ask you, have you, if you, if you haven't, maybe you might, when you start to remember your dreams, because I start to do this with my experiences, what vantage point did you see things? Did you see it like as your height, your eyes, or was you ever looking down? Right. That's oh yeah, it is. I, I would say that's, that's one of those sort of things that I think, um, tells me in my dreams, whether it's like a dream or more of like a spiritual experience, like a real spiritual lived experience that I'm having, having is that so often my dreams are a little more third person. Like I'm seeing them. Uh, I'm sort of a witness, even though I'm sort of uh -huh. simultaneously ex engaged in the dream. Uh, but when I just think of a couple examples, cause I had my, my grandfather passed away in 2020 and I had one dream where he came to me. And again, it was a very clear shift from me in a dream to, you know, like I'm there, like it's, like it's me experiencing it and I'm looking around, you know, and I'm making choices and I'm seeing my grandfather and my grandmother. And so anyway, like that, I don't know if that's how other people experience it, but for me, it does seem like that perspective shift is sort of a clue to me. It helps me understand, okay, what, what am I experiencing here spiritually? Yeah. 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 When you I mean, said, I, when my, you, yeah. My dreams, I couldn't really tell you like what perspective I saw something, but my experiences, um, you know, was OB or NDE spiritual experience, I guess it's yeah. um, at, at times it was as if I'm seeing. Yeah. Outside of, you know, and that my vision, when I drew when I was five, the first time I noticed my vision had changed is mm. uh, I was at the bottom of the water and then I rose up 
see, I wasn't realizing my body wasn't with me. I wasn't thinking about it. And I real and I was at the top of the water. And you know how you are in your water, you're either up or you're down, you know, if your vision. But I noticed my vision had changed. It was kind of like looking at it through the glass. I could see above and below at the same time. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. And I thought yes. my vision's changed. That's five years old. And I noticed that. Yeah. So it was like I was outside of this and this. It was all how you know, and uh, people look at me kind of weird and like, what are you talking about? Like, why is that important? I, th I think it's very important. I think yeah. it's very important how, how as a soul, we see it like, you know, we can see above and below at the same time. Yes. That was just fascinating to me. And then I know I mean, I hear some people hear things, um, say they're out of their body and they're looking around, say, you know, they had you know, near death experience and they hear people say stuff. I, I, for me personally, at my drowning, I didn't, I noticed my vision had changed, my hearing changed. I saw people, my family, and stuff, but I didn't hear them. I felt their emotions and their calls. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's so, so you're cool. having that telepathic in your dreams or you, yeah. is it because you know, it seems to me like it can be a mixture, like the drown, I mean, the ectopic price, it was a mixture, telepathic and then you know, voice and things. So. Yes. Or some, yes, yeah, sometimes both at the same time where you're maybe hearing something, but then you're getting the totality of the message like downloaded, you know, right in you in a way. Yeah. Oh like man. So many that, things. Yeah. It's like you're in that spiritual realm. It's like, you're not in yep. our sleep. You're in that yes. realm. Yep. For sure. And I think like, uh, you know, the way, the way Swedenborg describes the, spiritual world is well there's like a couple different sort of like principles that he writes about that are coming to my mind from what you're saying and one is um that uh you know the god and swedenborg refers to god as the lord he's often using that term the lord to mean like the lord god jesus christ and yet not in like a exclusively christian way but in sort of this more like cosmic the the divine you know the divine human one the sole creator of all things, you know, that divine being um, is the one that orders and guides everything through that omniscience and omnipotence, you know, like that's that sort of, and, and Swedenborg uses that term divine providence to describe this activity of the divine that's able to fully know everything that's happening and knows the future and the past, you know, everything and even the deepest you know, parts of our hearts to the most outermost levels. Um, and yet can guide all of that to all of our best eternal welfare while still respecting our own sense of, of, of freedom and agency as, you know, creative partners with, with the divine in our lives. And, and so hearing you talk about the process of your, like, the choosing or being at this threshold of, are you crossing over or not? And Jesus being with you and, and feeling the pain of your children, like that you, you know, have that experience of like, okay, this is how it has to happen. And you're on board with that. Like you're saying, okay, I'm not ready to go now. And to just sort of have a sense of how the divine can see the totality of the situation, you know, can eat, oh, already knows how this is going to affect your life way down the road, your children's lives, everything. And, and so I think about that too, in terms of the, you know, for myself and my sisters and our, when our mom did die, you know, and in her case, again, it's like, well, she had this, a cancer, you know, an inoperable cancer that was, you know, one of the most aggressive forms of brain cancer. Um, this was in the nineties when there wasn't, there's some more advancement in how to treat a glioblastoma, but not much. I mean, I'm not as familiar with the research now, but, um, that just knowing, okay, if that's like being able to, that Providence foresees what's going to happen and then provides that, uh, it will continue to generate goodness, you know, like that, that's just the way the world works. Uh, the, like the divine design is that for, for the world. Um, and so it can take it, take account of all of those details and make it all work together for good, uh, no matter what, you know, even, you know, and that's just like taking in of, you know, all of the horrendous suffering that, that my, we go through as humans. Um, yeah. Cousin Cheryl 
died of a brain tumor and she had four kids and the oldest girl was married, she married young. Okay. And then she had two girls, 11 and 13 and a boy. Mm. And I took in the 11 and 13 year old girls after she died. Oh, wow. And it was hard. They, I guess they were running wild on the streets before I got them because she's in bed dying of brain cancer. Her husband was off doing whatever. And then he got to sit to prison for rape of the oldest one that was married. She was having nightmares and her husband oh, had her goodness. go to counseling and it was a big mess. And then yes. the other boy, he went to another grandmother and uh, ended up going to prison because he shot her and an aunt. I mean, it was a big old mess. And then, so I have these two girls lost their mother. They had all this chaos going in their lives and yeah yeah it was late 80s so and much before you oh wow and actually so 11 13 my mom died on november 13th 11 13 <laughs> and we always i you know think of that number all the time because i was turning 11 and my older sister was turning 13 so it just sounds very similar to your cousin and their her daughter her children's experiences and yeah that makes me think of just like the you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about trauma and the effect that trauma has on our nervous systems. And that's also something that Swedenborg writes about that I find so fascinating is the way that our spirit and body interact with each other, because like our body is a vessel for our spirit, but things can happen to us as these material beings that really affect our spirit's ability to, uh, operate through our body and use it as the vessel that it would, you know, that it maybe could ideally be in the world, you know, and, um, and I just have so much, you know, compassion for, for people for who make hor like intense or bad choices or whatever that end up leading to negative consequences in their lives. But, but when their formative years are shrouded with this, with trauma, then it's like, so you can't, you, you don't choose that, you know, like, and that's, that's just what you sort of just have that. That's why, you know, it can seem like chance or like bad luck or something, but this, that's something I love the perspective that I gain from what Swedenborg wrote about is like, you know, divine providence has the longest term lens, you know, an eternal view of like what we go through in this world not only is it amazing when we can go through such horrendous experiences and use it for good here, you know, like tur some turning their lives around, you know, making contributions to society in amazing ways and just to each other, you know, through these kind of one-on-one -on -one interactions. But, but then we don't even know the sort of good that we might be led to even beyond, you know, beyond this world and the, and even the sort of like healing that can happen. I mean, yeah. Swedenborg writes about how like the, our time in the spiritual world, like that time when we first cross over, it could almost be described as like, that's when so much healing happens from just what our lives in this world were like. Uh, and we go through all these sort of specialized processes to help us heal and make sense of what went on uh, in the world. And then, but I really think that I find that we're getting better in human society at being able to do some of that healing, even, even while we're still alive in this world, you know, through the kind of research that people are doing into how to heal from trauma, you know, understanding the impacts of trauma that just feels like that's opening up all these opportunities for people to kind of, uh, take back their life and really feel like they can thrive in, yeah. in this world. Yeah. It seems like people need something to just grab onto right now. It's yes. like we're free falling. Yes. Yes. Like what happened to our country? What happened to yeah. our world? <laughs> What's happening tomorrow? Yeah. We don't know. <laughs> oh, well, that's something that uh, is amazing. Like you were saying about how like you can be dealing with a, you know, house fire or this like, like in heaven time, things can just wash away that quick. It's like, I think we have that access now and it's, through the levels of our mind or like that are, we might feel like it's just me and my consciousness. And here I am in this world. But one of like the key things that, that I've learned and, and have confirmed in my own life, but that I studied in Swedenborg is like, there are levels in our mind 
and we can learn about what the qualities of the different levels of our minds are and and actually even start to open those inner levels of our minds and that's through just awareness through ref- reflection you know and and things like meditation and other practices that help you start to think about you know go up one level and start to reflect on your on the outer level of your mind and and i feel like we when we connect into those inner levels of our minds they really are a refuge inside that has that bigger perspective and already is connected to that peace and love and hope you know that that we connect into through sometimes dreams and through near death experiences and i really think like no matter how chaotic the world is in this world it is possible for us to just like go up you know like to connect into that deep yeah. anchor point yeah, perspective. you know <laughs> yeah and then be able to show up in life from from love from sort of true wisdom that can sort of see the big picture and and respond appropriately rather than you know just reacting and everything sometimes i down rabbit holes i call them it's like oh no this happens that means this is going to happen and that's going to happen and 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 i've already got up like this is this horrible crisis and i'm like yeah (laughs) then i have to step back like well let's just take it one step at a time let's see yes it may not go to me (laughs) yes exactly and that part of you that says oh wait i'm in a rabbit hole hang on a second like that's that that's that inner self you know yeah Oh, that's very cool. So are, do you like interpret dreams for other people or is this something you just, you study or how far do you take this? Yeah, I, um, it's, I don't, I don't like, uh, formally interpret dreams for people. It's certainly something that I love to reflect on with people. Uh, and, um, but again, it's another interesting, um, resource that Swedenborg, uh, offers because he, um, one of the largest works that he wrote is a study of the Bible. Um, and in it, he, uh, he really just goes through the books of Genesis and Exodus, but what he says he is doing is taking it like word by word, verse by verse and writing out what he calls are the correspondences that are within the text of the Bible. And, um, you can basically render that as like symbols or something, but almost like they're, um, you know, the simplest thing is like, we all use hearts to, to show, you know, love, like I hearts you, you, you know, it's like, yeah, I love you or something. And, um, but that those symbols and then correspondences in the, in the Bible, like one of them that he writes about is like water being a symbol of, um, truth but, or it could also be a symbol of, uh, like falsity and so like the truth's opposite. And so depending on the context is the water, like what's happening to the water, what's going on. Um, it's so comprehensive what he has, even though it's only actually a slice of, of like what's, what's possible really for understanding. But he says that that knowledge of correspondences, like how earthly things correspond to spiritual realities in terms of like, you can, see a tree or see something happen in the natural world and then actually basically intuit a spiritual message from it. Um, He says that that actually was the basis for how there was open communication between people in this world and the people in the spiritual world um, who he calls angels. Like for him, angels are people, are just people who used to live in this world and are now in the spiritual world. Um, But uh, so that whole concept, I apply it to my dreams. Uh, because then, you know, that dreams that even dreams are like a state of consciousness that also sort of runs on the same principles as the spiritual world, you know? And so being able to, uh, and that that's really what Swedenborg writes is where the imagery in the Bible comes from and why you can have such weird things being written about in the Bible. And yet they actually make sense when you understand the symbology that's behind it, you know, like what's, what is it meaning? Um, and, and so, uh, getting to have that experience, applying that to dreams is, I find just really 
uh, fruitful because then, you know, it's so often you can have just like really weird, weird dreams, or you have a dream that like really impacts you. And what Swedenborg writes about correspondences is just like this helpful tool to be able to um, unpack it. So like nowadays people create books of, you know, dream symbols, you know, here's, here's what the different things in dreams mean. Um, And, and Swedenborg's work on correspondences is just another amazing and huge resource to use to apply to that. Um, And now are these all in books? Yes. Yep. In books. And um, at the Swedenborg Foundation, we have one, uh, we have a collection or a multi-volume set that we sell where it's taken what Swedenborg wrote about correspondences and putting it into like a dictionary format. So like a dictionary of correspondences um, so that you can just look up, you know, a dog, you know, and see what does, what did Swedenborg write that he understood a dog, you know, a dog to mean correspondentially in, in the Bible or, uh, or in his own spiritual experiences that he was having. Um, and, uh, and so I just find that it, it's really, it's just, it's another tool, you know, in the way that I think even just the natural world around us can be a tool for, for understanding. Is his stuff online? Spiritual insight. People can buy like Amazon? Yep. Yep. You can find it on Amazon. Also Swedenborg.com. Okay. Um, that's where we have an online bookstore um, okay. of all of these uh, resources. And, um, yeah, there's also a website that is called, uh, new Christian Bible study.org. I want to say, unless it's.com. Um, and that's a pretty, uh, easy user interface for doing a search in all of Swedenborg's books at once. Um, you can access a source, a search function there. Um, and then you can just sort of explore, you know, have some fun is like, look up different things and see, you sort of see, you'll start to see the way that Swedenborg describes what I mean, different I'm things I'm trying are. to picture like, is this, it has like one book, is this what he's talking about? Another book is what he's talking about, you know, or is it just all his writings and in, in volumes or? Yeah. So um, Swedenborg wrote, so he, it was in his mid fifties that he had these sort of transformative spiritual experiences that he says opened his spiritual eyes to being able to interact fully in the spiritual world as well as this world. And then after that time, he published 18 titles of works. And the first is what he calls secrets of heaven. And that was, um, that is, I mean, he, he was writing in Latin. So his works have all been translated into English. And that's something we do at the Swedenborg foundation is we do a project called the new century edition, where we're doing a fresh translation of Swedenborg's works into like a modern accessible, you know, gender inclusive, um, English. What a title. Is... That's a heck of a title. <laughs> I know. <laughs> now it's and got my attention already. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Secrets of heaven. And that is like huge. You know, that's, that's like eight, I think it's going to be 12 volumes in the, in the new century, in our, mo- in our English translations that we're producing. So we were just about to release volume three of secrets of heaven, um, volumes one and two are available right now. Um, and these are also available for a free PDF download on our website. Um, but you can also buy, buy paperback or hardcover copies of the books. Um, and so anyway, secrets of heaven is where he's going through the books of Genesis and Exodus and really unpacking all of this, all of the correspondences, like I was telling you about, um, and then after that, he published a number of titles uh, that kind of get, are more topical, where he published, like he's most known for his work that's called Heaven and Hell. And so that's where he just gives the most, like the most basic and accessible sort of straightforward, here's what I found out about heaven. Here's here's what I found out about hell. And then what he calls the world of spirits, like the, the spiritual realm. Now, did he find these things out through going through the Bible? And Yeah, so he... Um, it kind of seems like it was sort of in concert with him studying the Bible um, because he, um, like I said, he was a scientist, but at the time he was also a religious person. Like he was a part of the Swedish Lutheran church of his day in the 1700s. And, um, but he actually, so for him, he started, he started having really weird dreams and he started documenting his dreams. And he actually has the oldest 
and largest um, like dream diary that we know of that exists, like that is, is available in modern times. And so this was this dream diary that he kept um, that we also have on our website that uh, you have him writing down his dreams and then studying them for spiritual insight. And there was actually a psychologist named Wilson Van Dusen um, who was in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Um, he wrote a, published a commentary on Swedenborg's dream diary and sort of giving a psychological perspective, like a modern psychologist view of Swedenborg understanding the spiritual meaning of his dreams. And um, anyway, so through his, his dreams, he, he actually ended up having like a encounter with Jesus as the divine and um, had this experience where he um, ultimately felt like he was being, that his job was to, or like his spiritual mission for his life in this world was to reveal this, the sort of the reality of the afterlife and how present it is to us and the inner meaning of the Bible. Like the fact that the, the Bible has this um, inner meaning that, that is, you know, so rich, you know, something that can really help us in our, in our spiritual lives. And, um, and so uh, anyway, so he published, that was sort of his mission in writing this was that he, um, he felt like he was being given as he sort of says it, that he was, um, that the divine, that God gave him this full access to the spiritual world, you know, being conscious of the spiritual world while also living in this world for the purpose of being able to publish and like report, like, here's what the spiritual world is like. And, and at that time it was like for him to, it was like a major, like, Christianity is going so off course. We've really got to reset things, you know, like we've really got to, uh, get, get back to the core purpose of this, which is love, you know, which is, um, uh, you know, no longer like he basically describes that the, the Christianity of his day. And this was like, I mean, this was also at the time when Christianity was starting to splinter in so many denominations and stuff, but he was saying, calling out how wrong it was for and he was using Christianity, but this could go for any faith of like religion controlling how people thought and creating this barrier between people and the divine reality in themselves and in the world. And that like, that was really cutting off our, you know, the Spiritual everyone's. Life. Yeah, exactly. For us to be able to have the kind of like thriving and empowered spiritual life and relationship with the divine that we're, that we're meant to have. And so that was sort of like, the the purpose was to like wake people up and and empower people to know how free they are you know like that that we have the like that the whole concept of faith isn't like writing your name in some book somewhere you know or like saying you believe a certain thing but it's really this like it's all about our our lives like it is the spiritual reality that we exist in and that we're you know what's the purpose of life is like you know to be showing up for each other this like usefulness and respect and everything. So that, that was like a super long-winded answer to your question, but like his, that, that's sort of his, his mission. And so then he published a bunch of other titles. I could go over them if you want me to, but. My ex-husband uh, is Catholic and I was you know, trying to get used to their church and the rehearsed prayers, like say this many Hail Marys and Our Fathers and like, why yes yes can't i just talk to god <laughs> exactly <find> my problems <laughs> uh yeah i never got anything out of rehearsed prayers and i you yeah. know my kids would sit with their aunts and i see them doing the rosary and oh lord <laughs> well that just that's wasn't like, for yeah. me one of the like key key phrases that Swedenborg says that he, he had this experience where he was in the spiritual world and he came across this, um, like a temple, but the temple was basically like all glass, you know, fully translucent. And in this, and, uh, and in it, there was like, I think there was like a copy of the Bible that was like shining, you know, spiritual light and above the door 
to the entrance to the temple was written these words um, that was called now it is permitted or like now it is allowed or allowable for people to enter with understanding into the mysteries of faith that like this idea of like we have like it's time for people to have their spiritual eyes open while they're doing the faith thing and that and part of what Swedenborg was writing was to give people um that uh you know the tools for understanding like why why do ritual you know like why does ritual really matter and it's like well it's not just like oh just do it rote because it's like gonna be some magic spell but it's like there can actually be a power to saying certain words like if you understand sort of the purpose the inner the inner meaning if you will of like a certain action then you're going to then you can actually use things like rituals to to really support yourself like I, that's something for me with ritual because like um they act it can seem so pointless and yet if we're empowered in the use of ritual it can be so yeah yeah it can be so healing that that it does something to them i mean do it it's right just, you know yeah like, or, or create create your own ritual you know if it's like if you yeah. really need to let go of something you know think about what what are the physical symbols that i could use that will help me help my spirit let go of an issue like when we do something physically it kind of helps like because we're spirits and we're bodies so it's like to do to create to do spiritual things when we do it in our physical body it can help our spirit to really like if it's let go of something or process some issue or you know like that kind of uh i don't know what you would call it but that i sort of see that as like that's like the spiritual power of ritual that that yes in some traditions it's like it's so lost people are like why are we saying these words like why do i have to do this thing or touch that thing yeah. or whatever everybody's you different know? you know like i can't yeah. do zumba class and i can't do line <laughs> dancing i mean i just i don't follow i don't do well following in a crowd and, <laughs> yes, and being yes. robotic i just gotta yeah <laughs> you know? yes, i do yes. my thing get wild jiggy and <laughs> exactly that's great that's great your own i uh you know spontaneous spontaneous ritual or yeah. expressive meditation or something like that i think that's great. i'm that way about vacations too i don't like to plan them i think the best vacations is spur of the moment hey this is good because yes. you plan totally. them i'll talk myself out of it i'll decide the money can be better spent so or else i'm yes. worried about being in a car wreck or you know i'll just oh, yes. overthink it oh that's great i love that that's great is, is there anything else that you'd like to add let's see um Gosh, this has been such a wonderful conversation. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I guess, I guess just to rattle off, just if it's interesting to people, like I said, there's the book Heaven and Hell. Um, he has a book called Divine Providence, which like I really love. Um, that's like maybe my favorite. And then uh, he has a book called Divine Love and Wisdom. And, and then one of the last books he published was called um, True Christianity. And so that's like where he's really getting into sort of dealing with the, the Christian doctrine of his day and sort of uh, giving a sort of reset to it. Um, and um, yeah, so just if that's of interest to anybody, that's out there. It's cool stuff. Okay. Um, after we say goodbye, I want to ask you a question real quick. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so, oh, one more thing before we go. So the Swedenborg, do they just go to that website to find these books? Yep, Swedenborg.com. And okay. then you can either navigate to the bookstore, or I think if it's like Swedenborg.com slash bookstore would get you right there. Uh, like I said, the, the translations, this modern English translation that we produce is called the New Century Edition. So you'll see that's, that's a little distinct from the other, uh, there are other translations available of all of Swedenborg's works. Um, but uh, those new century edition volumes are really, they just really make the content accessible. Cause you can imagine, here's this guy writing in the 1700s, then it gets translated into English and then continually translated into English. But like in the 1800s, it's like, it's not necessarily for our ears now, but now with the new century edition, that's, it's like really kind of bringing it to life in a new way, which is cool. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where you can really explore that stuff. Okay. I'm 
curious, what do you guys do there? Like you work there? Like this is a job? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Did you sell the books? I mean, you read the books? <laughs> That's right. So we have, we have an amazing translation team that is working on translating Swedenborg's works. Um, oh. And so we have Latin translators who are experts in the language that Swedenborg was using at that time. Um, and so then there's a whole host of, you know, everything that's involved in publishing books, we do. So we're an independent publisher in that way. Um, and then we also have a lot of programming. So the, the Off the Left Eye YouTube channel, that's, that's a part of our work. Um, I uh, host and create a podcast that's called Inside Off the Left Eye, um, where that's, uh, again, we kind of just take these little bite-sized pieces of Swedenborg's uh, what he wrote, different passages, and then like reflect on them. Like, what is that like for spiritual life today? Or what do we, what can we draw from that? You know, uh, we just sort of ponder the stuff. And um, what's the significance of left eye? Yeah, off the left eye. So that comes from uh, something Swedenborg wrote where he, um, it's in, it's in heaven and hell. And it's also in secrets of heaven where Swedenborg, and then it's also in his dream diary where Swedenborg, like that's where he made his first or I guess it's a, he, he kept a journal of his spiritual experiences and those have been published as well. Um, so it's like literally where he was writing it down for the first time. Uh, he writes of, again, sort of for posterity's sake, he was given the experience of going through the dying process to be able to, while, while keeping that kind of third person consciousness awake. So he went through the full dying process to sort of like his little scientist mind to write down what was, what was happening to him and uh, what, what it was like. And we created a video on off the left eye um, that animates what Swedenborg wrote. Um, I guess that's probably called what happens when you die. You would probably find it on our channel if you search that um, or what, no, it's called what dying feels like. That's the video we made where we made this short, really powerful um, animated video of of it's just the what Swedenborg said happened to him, but then we have animators who created these beautiful. Uh, we just have a fun videos. job. Yeah, it's pretty fun, <laughs> <laughs> and we just get to like have fun thinking about all these spiritual topics. Um, and can I go work and, with them? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and he. Uh, so what was I saying about that video? Oh yeah, so through the dying process, Swedenborg describes being like awakened by angels. Um, we did a full full length, like hour and a half long video called what happens immediately after you die, or maybe, that, and, or what happens when you die. One of those two that sort of unpacks what he says happens. Um, but he, uh, at one point he says that like a covering was rolled off his left eye and like that, that at first when he woke up or woke, like when his consciousness came awake after being sort of carefully transitioned from the earth into the spiritual world fully, he um, was uh, felt, he felt, you know, he felt the presence of love and he felt this telepathic communication happening between him and these angels who were with him. Um, but that was like a, what he calls your like highest heavenly state. Like he was drawn up to that higher, most uppermost level in himself because um he says that's where we're all taken first is like to, to carefully have the passage from this world to the next, we are basically like cradled in love in like love itself. And that's this, like, that's like the strongest protective barrier you can have. And that takes us across the veil, if you will. And, but in that we like barely have any thought when we're in that state, because it's just like the experience of pure love. But then we, your consciousness, oops, sorry, your consciousness comes down levels uh, to then be able to like have your waking thought, you know, have your like brain start, your mind turn on, you know, you start to be able to think again. And so he describes that particular shift from that like super love packed phase to then being able to like see and interact with the world around him. He says this like covering was rolled off of his left eye and yeah. then he could see in that he could see the beings and the things that were around him and start to, you know, interact and, and have conversations with people. So that's where off the left eye came from. It's sort of a play on this veil being rolled off your eye to be able to see spiritual things. Even that, oh my gosh, here we go on. But like Swedenborg talks about like the, 
you know, the correspondence of your left eye versus your right eye and, you know, all that kind of detail uh, is really interesting. The morning I uh, wrote my book, which I didn't expect to write a book that morning, but um, <laughs> the I morning this... I wrote my book, <laughs> how yeah. many days start like that? That's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. um, I was like through this turmoil and um, all of a sudden I saw me from above. I'll ask you all go, what way do you see yourself yes. in this? Yes, exactly. And I see myself in a creek and I was bit over, like picking up something like bits of light or something out of this creek. And there's these trees that lined it. And, um, mm. and then it was like this curtain went to the side. It was like this, like remove something. And I like, when it did that, I was like, I get it now. Like oh, I have been yes. hiding all of the abuse and trauma and the spiritual experiences under the rug, just the same. And I grabbed my laptop and I just start and I quit for three months. Oh, oh, because awesome. before I tried just writing in notebooks, my bad experiences, trying to get it out of me. Like I thought if I could put it mm. in a drawer, like there, it's over yes. there. I don't need to carry it around. <laughs> it wouldn't work. And I just tried it the day before and I got this morning, felt just as bad. And I just felt oh. like I was doomed, you know, to carry this, you know, PTSD and this trauma. And, yeah, yeah. And then that, ha then I saw this, this vision just seen, you know, of me, I don't know what that was about, you know, really me just bent over, picking up a dozen, this creek, picking up these like bits of light. And then it just, so, you know, I don't know if it was like, you know, what I was picking up, was it like picking up these memories, you know, I don't, yes. you know, I don't know. It was just like this vision came and then this, just like this curtain, it was just like moved. And when it got past, it was like, I saw, it was wow. like, I clearly now I get it, you know? It's like I was like in darkness and it's like it was moved and I could see I see the light or something. It was just strange. Yeah. But anyway, that's what happened. I and just, then you were cleared. Like yep. yeah. Oh my goodness. So. That's amazing. I wonder if that like uh uh you know, if you reaching into the water and you said there were sort of like sparkling mm -hmm. things that you were pulling out of it, if it was like you being willing to go in and take that and bring it out was like, yes, now that's, you know, now it's time to really yeah. give that away. And I, I think that that's like, you know, we, we need each other, you know, like the, like spiritual community, having people to, um, you know, like you say, it's not, it's sort of not going to be enough to just like, oh, okay, I'm going to do it and stick it in the drawer and it'll be done. It's like, there's, it seems like that's part of the design is that what we go through becomes a gift to others, you know, when we're willing to like step in. And I think that like authenticity, you know, really have full self-expression. That's actually what the divine wills for us is like you as you is what I want to have shine in the world, you know, and, you know, but you have to be willing to, to pick those things up. Yeah. yeah. I, I was embracing it. I was yeah. like trying, always trying to get it away, get away from me, get away from me. You know, yeah. everyone didn't want to hear it. You know, we've heard it before. Yeah. You know, they heard it in a monotone, like reading a grocery list, not my feelings and pour my heart. Nobody yeah. wanted to hear the bad stuff. And so why would I tell the spiritual? Cause it's too weird. They're not, you know, they don't hear anything. I'm already looking weird enough by having all these bad memories that I can't get past. And they're like, put it in the past. I'm like, I can't, I can't, I can't, you know, and I wanted to, but it was like this record player just kept playing. Yes. I don't know. And I would have triggers. I'd be just doing fine. Yes. And somebody say, how's your mother? And all yes. that PT, that's all it took was somebody oh, say, yeah. your mother. And there everything's flooding back. And so I was like, I wanted off that train, you know, I wanted to yes. jump track and and I was trying to get rid of it and then when that happened I thought I have got to write the bad so I can also write the good and people mm. appreciate the good because mm. they wouldn't appreciate if I just wrote all these wonderful things or if I wrote yeah. all the bad things it would be so dark and horrible who and yeah. I would write it on notebooks just to get out of me I think who would want to read this it's yeah. horrible stuff mm. it's, so, it's mm -hmm. grotesque mm -hmm. this isn't um stuff you talk about the water cooler they say yes yeah and and so i i 
and it was so gut wrenching. But what I did at this time, I felt a presence standing right behind my laptop the whole time I was writing, and it was just oh. like fell it to that person, and I just started at the beginning, and I just went, and there was things I didn't understand, and it, there was someone just tell me. It's not for you to understand. It's for you to, like, as a witness, just witness, yes. witness, witness. And later, somebody else would, maybe scientists or somebody, would understand these things. And which has come to pass. Because like you just said, well, maybe it was this, you know, and mm-hmm. you pick it up. And I'm like, yeah, that was it. It was like yeah. I had to pull this light out. It was like this, this little creek was me. Like the water, you know, I was pouring yes. out of me. Like, and... Because there was beauty in there. Among all this ugly, horrible stuff, there was beauty. There were miracles, spiritual experiences that were just like bits of light that were so beautiful. But they were in this mud and I had to pick them out. And Oh, it's so amazing. And that's that really reminds me of like actually, you know, Swedenborg, um, that was he, his dreams gave him that kind of insight about his life too, you know, it's like, okay, this is, this is what I'm working on now. And like sort of giving some advanced encouragement, you know, or awareness of like, this is what's going to happen next. So I love that that dream that you had really actually is like such a power packed. And I don't know how long ago it was that you wrote your book, but like that had all of it in there. 2016, I think. Okay. Okay. So it's like, here you are now and you're getting to see how meaningful that one dream was. Like, that's the kind of like spiritual wisdom that is inside of those. Yeah. And it, it was, if you would say a daydream, you know, cause it was early morning and I was just like, Oh, I'm never yes. going to get over this stuff. Like waving the white flag to life. Like I give up. Yes. Never going to try yes. anything, all this horrible stuff. And I can't get it out of my mind. I'm just going to live the rest of my life with these horrible memories. And then this just, I saw this vision. And, you know, yeah. say a daydream, I guess, you know, and then the yeah, this, yeah. This curtain just passed. It made me think of it when you said off on a thigh, because I always wondered what that was. I yes. never thought of anything like sort that. Of this, like veil moving and sort of like then that allowing that full alignment yeah. and like integration of your whole self, being able to go out and, you know, really offer it to the world. I think of that too, of how healing creativity is. And creativity is like such a word that can sometimes mean, you know, a lot of self-effort, but I really sort of think of it as being like at its core, it's our truest alignment with the divine. And when we really act from that partnership, uh, that just seems like that's how we, like, that's what you're doing with I think creativity is like in that. Hero. Yeah. 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 So I found that to be true for my life too. That's so great. Yeah. Well, I always say, you know, when I get depressed, I start drawing house plans. Oh yeah. Nice. Plans. Oh, that's great. <laughs> when it's going to go here no it goes here it's just so much focus it goes into I love that <laughs> I was just getting that sense for myself too I'm like because I have one creative project that I've been working on for a long time but then like things have felt really hard recently and sort of like going through s- struggle and stuff and then I just had this like little thought and again it's like did I have that thought or was that sort of like angel insight you know a little angel giving me some perspective of like try this it was just like maybe you just need to have fun creating something, you know, like just do something for the fun of it. And like, what are you going to create? And there's like no expectation, just create something. And, and there, I just feel this intuitive sense that like, yes, that is what's going to be right for my spirit. Like that's going to help me. I don't know where it's going to take me, but like, yes, I'm just going to open myself up to that and see where it leads. So yeah. It's a space I don't like to leave. When I get my creative space, I don't want to leave it for nothing. I know. <laughs> I do it's other so things. restorative. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It's important. Well, I appreciate your time. It's been very interesting. And when you said, yeah. when I was in my 30s, I thought, girl, you're 12. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I'm still in my 30s, but yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say goodbye and then I'll just leave this thing ready because I just want to say real quick. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks so much, Peggy. This has really been wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.